If Cambridge Analytica and the Mueller report taught us anything, is the data held by large tech conglomerates such as Google and Facebook are often stored off-site in data banks that are incredibly insecure. In this debate, what's important for us to know is that these large tech companies such as Google and Facebook often hold incredible amounts of personal data. In order for you to create a Facebook account, you need to put your name, your real age, right? In some cases, in order to verify your age, you need to verify a credit card. These are incredible personal personal information that are often stored in large data banks that Facebook uses to analyze which large data sets and training data. and we're going to talk about why it's problematic in this speech. This debate is simple. Whether or not we should break up large tech conglomerates depends on which side of the house better benefits consumers at the end of the day. We're going to show you why on the outside of the house it is in the interest of the consumers of tech industries i.e. you and me, is that these large conglomerates are broken up into smaller individual pieces that, that hold far less control over uh, the data of people. I can uh, time if you need to do that. Have a seat. So I'm going to be talking about two things in the speech. I'll be talking firstly why large tech conglomerates such as Facebook and Google hold an incredible amount of personal data and why it's incredibly hard to regulate by law. Secondly, I'm going to talk about how breaking up these uh, conglomerates improves consumer welfare in a number of different ways. Firstly, why large tech conglomerates such as like these things hold a lot of personal data and why this is something that's difficult. Understand that when we talk about these uh, large tech companies, the business model, number, firstly and very simply, is selling uh, technological services. So if you look at Google, they sell services such as email, such as maps, such as YouTube. These are things that consumers consume and things that people use on a daily basis. Facebook, the primary business model is selling targeted advertisements. This means to say they build a profile on individuals and when a company wants to sell data, for example, you're a company that you target a specific subset of the population, a specific, a specific demographic that are more likely to buy your shoes, Facebook markets and targets sell these ads to those people. That's how they make money. The problem here is that this is that these tech conglomerates, in the process of uh, yes. selling the services, often hold large amounts of personal data that I've already talked about at the start of my speech. The problem, the problem isn't so much that they hold this data. I have seen. The problem is that they hold so much of this data consolidated in large data banks that are not very secure. If you look at Cambridge Analytica, if which was a service that basically brought about by influencing public opinion. When the, when the scandal broke and when it was found out that Facebook released all this personal information to Cambridge Analytica, there was a huge uproar because people didn't know to what extent their personal data was being released to these tech companies. People would, didn't understand to what extent they were giving up the freedom of their information and control over their lives and giving them over to these tech conglomerates. Why is this something that's so problematic? Why do we can't do this to normal legislative process? I'll take you up the argument. Okay? So simply, if you look at the congressional hearings of Mark Zuckerberg in Congress and the Google representative, you will notice that those congressmen and those senators questioning Mark Zuckerberg didn't really understand the nuances of how these tech industries operate. You have congressmen asking them, if I take a picture of my phone and upload it to Facebook, will people be able to see this photo? I think for like the generation such as you and me, we understand that if you upload a photo to Facebook, people will see it. But the fact of the matter is that the legislative senators and these congressmen aren't in a position to legislate these tech companies because it's a new and emerging industry that they didn't have, that they didn't predict like years ago when they were creating laws. There are no way to regulate the control of personal data by these companies. Secondly, we would say that there is like, even if the people aren't equipped to tackle the law, the law itself is not equipped to tackle it. So under the print laws, right, there's a difference between content producers and content platforms. So if you're a content platform, you don't have an obligation to moderate the sort of content that is being placed on your platform, such as the magazine stand, because you don't print the magazines, right? But Facebook has at times tried to sell itself as a content platform, and at other times tried to sell itself as content producers, and have used this distinction in the law to worm its way around numerous lawsuits and to dodge accountability and responsibility for the amount of personal data they have given out to a number of people. The the conclusion of the argument is simple. Facebook and Google hold control over way too much personal data, and there's no way for the current law to regulate it or to legislate to prevent it or like to legislate to ensure the consumer's data and welfare are protected within the status quo. Yes. Uh, so in your case, if in principle we have better congressmen who understand the kinds of problems that is with data, or we have better enforcement of legislation, what is the problem with the style of government? 
The problem is that they are monopoly and they hold sole control over the industry, right? That this so I'm also going to talk about that industry. So the second thing I want to talk about is how breaking up these tech conglomerates improves consumer welfare. I think this is not really a policy debate, but like mechanistically, what we're talking about is under existing antitrust laws, we break up Facebook and Google's into smaller constituents. For example, when Facebook bought over WhatsApp and Instagram, we're going to break them up back into WhatsApp and Instagram. These will all be individual companies that will not be controlled by Facebook. Google Maps, Google Translate, and YouTube will all be smaller companies not be controlled by Google. I think this is a model that is perfectly functional. There are four benefits to this. The first is data security. All the problems that we talked about in the earlier speech, when we break up these companies into different, uh, sub different constituent parts, the data security is improved. How? Because Facebook in itself holds, they know your name, they know your age, they know your phone number, they, your, they know your address. For instance, if we break them up into WhatsApp, WhatsApp does not need to know your address. So for instance, even if the data banks that WhatsApp is compromised, they won't get access to a consumer's WhatsApp and they won't get access to a consumer's banking details. I think the distribution of data, of like ne the data necessary for each individual constituent uh, service to function means that data as a whole is more secure and better protected at the end of the day. The second thing why this is good is Competition. Understand that not just the, that not just do this uh, conglomerates control data. They also monopolize the industry. What it looks like is smaller tech companies like other forms of social media being unable to penetrate the market and unable to start themselves because Facebook has is just so much more powerful and just so much more reputable that they're able to price out their competitors in the industry. Breaking them up into smaller uh, constituent companies make it easier for new people to enter the market. Make it easier for people to uh, like charge uh, like make it easier for people to uh, like you know, enter the market, but also makes it better for advertisers because the problem right now is that because Facebook is the only platform in which people use, Facebook uses it to leverage against advertisers, which means that it prioritizes the rich people or like the rich corporations who are able to pay and afford its advertisements over other poor people. In a more distributed industry, this is far less likely to happen. Thirdly, we say you have a lot more innovation. So at the point where Facebook is not the only company that you have to work with as an IT graduate, you're far more likely to try to invest in a tech startup, for instance. You're far more likely to develop new and new existing technologies to deal with problems in the status quo. For instance, like uh, the, the guy that developed the Huawei, the screen for that thing. What but the, the AMOLED display, like basically that was a guy that didn't do it within Facebook, he did it outside of Facebook. But the reason that he was able to do it was because he had like the backing of rich people. Uh. On the outside, we have a lot more innovation. Uh, we have a lot more innovation. We have a lot more new and moving the tech industry forward for all those reasons we propose. Considering half the Prime Minister's speech was mainly talking about one thing that just Facebook did with regards to big data, and therefore there is a reason why they now want to break up all these huge tech companies. Only after Sanji PR did they actually want to talk about their alternative, which is all these smaller companies. Still, no proper analysis or illustration as to what those smaller companies look like in your world. What are these lives going to look like? Here's what I'm going to do in my speech. Firstly, a bit of case setup, uh, secondly, rebuttals, and then I'll provide two argumentations. The first is to talk about the magnitude of jobs that side of government is simply trading off and explain to you why that cannot be traded off. And secondly, why big technology, but why big tech companies delivers high efficient consumer goods and services and why that is inherently a good thing. Uh, Okay, so what are the things that we defend on side of opposition? Four things. The first, we support the free market and the very idea of it, and we think the having giant tech conglomerates supports the very idea of the free market. Secondly, we defend civil suits if like tech companies mess up. We will support individuals filing complaints or even lawsuits against these companies. Thirdly, we will protect 
Uh, we defend labor laws with limited economic intervention. And lastly, we also support lobbying regulations by tech companies to ensure, it's like, to mitigate these very issues. We think the problem that exists in status quo is regulation. These are things which can be controlled. The very idea and principle of big tech companies shouldn't be sacrificed simply because some people don't know how to follow laws. If that's the only problem, I think that's unreasonable. Uh, have a seat. So um, most of my rebuttals will be integrated. There's one thing which doesn't fit in, which is to answer the question, is big data inherently a bad thing? Two responses. The first, we believe big data is something which is good for users because this means it takes into account what are your interests, your search history, etc. which also means that the products which they target to you will more often than not be products which you actually have a use for, which just increases the very convenience for individuals. If consumers are the stakeholders, we all want to prioritize at the end of the day. I think big data is something which definitely benefits these individuals at the end of the day. Uh, second thing is this idea of how like legislators lack understanding, right? So I do not understand why there's an obligation on Facebook to change and like just become a smaller company altogether because some old people in Congress don't understand how the internet works, right? I think these are the same individuals who you still need to, who you will still have in your world, the part in which your tech companies are immoral, how will they then deal with those circumstances considering the problem is a lack of understanding by Congress. I think the solution to this problem is to ensure that these legislators do understand. I think over time, more and more individuals will understand how the internet works, and therefore it's more difficult for like these companies to get away with these acts. We don't think the problem should be these companies just changing. Okay. Before I proceed to my arguments, uh, seeing that there are no laws in the status quo, and Facebook and Google are large com companies that have a lot of money that can lobby how your laws are functioning, how will your laws be better in comparison to our Okay, so like these laws can be improved over time when more and more individuals use calm down, huh? when more and more individuals use this form of technology, that means there's more understanding on it, more research on it, and I think generally that means more individuals understand how these things work. But we think it like even if we take this regulation thing at its best, here are the things that side of government trades off. Let's talk about jobs. Three levels of argumentation. The first is like these huge companies, right? have tons of jobs that they provide because of the subsidiaries that they have, because of the major reach that they require, means that they need a lot of individuals part of that corporation. These small companies you have on side of government can never compete with the level or magnitude of jobs that companies like Facebook and Amazon can advocate. In fact, I think your unicorn companies that exist in their world oftentimes rely on big technology like Amazon and Facebook. The fact that you use these very platforms to reach out and sell your very products in order for you to understand what are the best ways people are using this technology and maybe there's a form of inspiration that I can take. These are companies which inherently will die out in your world because they have less ideas in order to kickstart their very business altogether. It's more difficult for them to reach out to, to individuals and consumers in your world. We do not understand how your comparative is a lot better. The vacuum that, they, that you create, the point which you eradicate all these huge companies can never be filled by your small companies. They do not have the same amount of funds. They have the same amount of power or credibility. You cannot absorb those benefits. Have you seen? But the second level to this argument, is to explain that these companies create a foundation of sustainable economic growth. Two parts of this argument. The first is that these companies have a lot of money, right? This means that it's easier for them to channel these jobs and keep these jobs going and ensure that it doesn't fail at any point. If your companies are small, this means the type of consumers and market you have is one that is limited. We think it's more likely for your companies to die out in the end and therefore the comparative is worse because individuals lose jobs. But secondly, what are the type of jobs that we're talking about, right? Because these huge companies have the ability to provide corporate jobs. And these corporate jobs are particularly important because these are jobs which allows and gives individuals experience and information on how to deal things with, with management, how to deal with a company. And this helps these individuals climb corporate ladders. The comparative in your world, it's either your jobs are terrible to begin with, or these are jobs that are allocated by your government. They will never be of the same magnitude as corporate jobs. Your form of social mobility doesn't exist. Have you seen? But thirdly, and most importantly, is that because these companies are huge, we create brand new industries. The fact that 30 years ago, I, I think 30 years ago, something like a cloud data analyst wasn't even a real job. But now it's something which is just which is legitimate, right? And the reason why this happens is because these companies have the funds to grow and challenge the definition of normal jobs in status 
for. This is why they can increase things like funding, increase things like training and education to individuals to better to better like prepare these individuals towards a more innovative and technological world. Even in small areas, when the rare instance that these companies like Amazon and Facebook cannot reach out to, these smaller companies in those areas use that very same technology or at the very end of the day, create their own version of their idea. So for example, if Amazon Go sends groceries to individuals, but there are areas where they cannot reach and do so, other companies will also think of the idea of sending groceries door to door. I think that creates like, um, Businesses for individuals. But at the end of the day, what you create is more demand to these very products and a continuous growth. So there are more jobs for more people, meaning individuals on the ground are more financially secure. The comparative is your jobs suck and your funds for your health benefits within those jobs essentially will never be as good. If you really want to talk about people at the end of the day, a side of opposition does best in ensuring the quality of products is good and that these individuals will always be thought of first. This is live stream, I should look for this one. The best I can do, right? This debate requires us to understand how monopolies work. What are the comparisons in when you break down these industries, where have they systematically worked in the past, and why is this beneficial on our side of the house? A couple of rebuttals that don't fit in. The main argument that came up from Ayman was the idea of jobs, right? The existence of jobs. Let's break this argumentation down to how it should have been labeled. We're talking about a top-down approach towards improving economics within a particular nation. They only provided one level of analysis, talking about corporate jobs. I'll take this down, I'll give you two more levels, and I'll take that down too. Firstly, corporate jobs. In the majority of circumstances, monopolies tend to abuse workers that work within this. So when we talk about Facebook and Google, in the majority of circumstances, it tends to be laying off individuals. It tends to be work hours that are unfair. And it tends to be the lack of ability for you to opt into another industry. This means if you are a software engineer, or if you are a tech graduate, the fact that there are only two monopolies or one monopoly for you to opt into, it allows them to be able to abuse you. Where have we seen this in the past? We see this within Wall Street, where we allow to abuse workers and the corporate issues of how it increases these circumstances. But two, we also see this within petrol industries where the workers were systematically forced to work within terrible conditions because they had no opt-out mechanisms at the point in which we had monopolies in the past which is why we broke them down this is why we see Roxxon oil in the US breaking out to Exxon Mobil and Block Oil in order to be able to compare compete within each other but if you don't understand that a basic analysis is grab and Uber for example when there was a competition that existed within these circumstances a worker life improved in the areas B worker amounts of the amount of money that you get as a worker improved and C the amount of workers improved when you small down towards a monopoly, i.e. when Grab bought over Uber, which is what they're talking about in the status quo, it tends to be A, less workers because you're allowed to do so, B, higher prices, C, abusing workers. The fact is that a majority of them can't opt out the system because the taxi industry in Malaysia has fallen down because of the monopoly and the strength. The ability for them to control and buy over Uber means they have no alternatives to opt out, and the fact that they already bought cars or sold themselves means the poorest individuals are marginalized in their communities. Two levels of analysis to improve this argumentation. Firstly, the way that top-down approach works is taxation by states and increasing of this to development of areas where top-down approach of economics entering these areas. In the majority of circumstances, Facebook and Google don't pay taxes to governments. The reason being is because they promise ideas of jobs coming in and the ability for them to opt into tax breaks tends to be the majority of circumstances why these governments never see a dime. But on top of that, the fact that you have a small conglomerate of individuals tends to mean when they want to downsize, they bring you down to the lowest. What is the comparison? You see Grab and Uber having more workers and better working conditions. When you have a monopoly and you only have one alternative, it tends to be less workers because you don't want to hire as much, higher prices and worse working conditions. Santu. So Virginia realizes that Amazon building a second headquarters there is much better than any tax that you can get from Amazon. Already tells you that powerful governments realize the kinds of impacts those companies have the point which they come into the city. That's Why is that not problematic? 
That's a lie, right? Amazon coming into Virginia has garnered zero jobs. The reason being is because Amazon is a tech company. The majority of their work is outsourced within developing nations, i.e. the job offers that they have right now tend to be residing within China, India, and also within South Africa, if I'm not mistaken. The fact is that this didn't change when they brought their headquarters here. You just paid for them to get their headquarters, gave them land, and it never increases jobs, which is why Virginia people are opposing the state and the curse within the status quo. Secondly, they came up with the idea that laws require understanding. This refuses to accept the fact that lobbying powers exist to be able to shape laws. The comparison is when you have smaller companies, it means the lack of ability for you to be able to have as much funding in order for you to monopolize or lobby laws. But on the comparison, if you have that within status quo and you get to shape the laws, it tends to be very difficult to bring or change the laws in the future with your understanding because it takes two thirds majority within Congress. The idea that high numbers of lobbying exist within these areas, you see your own rate falling down within the status quo. The fact is, big companies like the gun industry are allowed to manipulate the government and that happens continuously over long periods of time at the point at which they establish laws and that cannot change. The comparison is in the status quo, we do not have these laws established. At the point at which you break up companies, you allow the control over the legal system, which comparatively benefits these circumstances. But lastly, he talked to me about business models and exceptions, how, you know, on the side, the house business, uh, businesses are going to work uh, better on the side, businesses are going to work better uh, because they get to predict interest of consumer basis and everything like that. Firstly, all these things already happen within the status quo and will happen on our side better. What does this mean? What does splitting up look like? This looks like it. For example, Google Map buying over Waze, it looks like splitting up Google from Google Maps, splitting up Waze from Google Maps, and allowing competitions between multiple industries to work. When Google Maps bought over Waze, the amount of workers decreased, the price for you to find the, the service quality of Waze increased, and the amount of manipulating of information that they get to collect from Google Maps increase. That means the privacy data change within Google Maps to be able to collect your location every point in time when you use the app. These are all abuses that happen when monopolies exist. Facebook, it looks like breaking up, for example, WhatsApp, Instagram, Snapchat, all from Facebook, bringing them back to separate companies instead of Facebook buying over these monopolies. This means that businesses can still exist in all these circumstances, right? When I break up all these industries, I can still trade with WhatsApp or Instagram or Snapchat. I just don't pay Facebook for doing this and all these infrastructures still exist in the status quo. Comparative benefits that I've never responded to. TJ talked to you about multiple things. He talked to you about the idea that privacy data is breached in the majority of circumstances. He talked to you about the idea of laws being unable to change. And he talked to you about the idea of comparative benefits. And all of those had no responses. Citizens' lives are put at risk at a point in which we don't have oversight over an industry. All these things came up from TJ. What is it going to provide in my speech? A, the idea that independent think tanks get to evolve the development of economies. What does this mean? In the status quo, a monopoly means you get to A, buy out other people so think tanks don't get to exist so your technology doesn't develop because they want a monopoly of the industry. But B, it has to be lobbying politicians to reduce fundings for think tanks that are government oriented. This means that if you are a government occurring within the United States and Facebook is paying you maybe one. Point two million dollars to, for example, avoid having think tanks. The ability for you to opt out of that information is very high. That means we still have control and a monopoly towards how tech companies increase. But this systematically oppresses a lot of minority individuals or individuals who are poor from entering industries. Why so? The Facebook has an active industry, an active incentive to increase a monopoly within these circumstances. This looks like meaning. This looks like hiring, for example, less minority workers to work on your projects or less development. It has to be white men working on this. Why did the harms of this. We look at facial recognition technology in the status quo. It significantly impairs black people, meaning you're more likely to get caught for a crime by facial recognition technology because of this. And it tends to be because the data and algorithm sets are set by white men based on white men's standards and based on the images of white individuals because of the lack of ability for individuals to enter an industry. The comparative benefit is if you split up these industries, all of them have less money. They have less money, they need to operate, and they need to hire more workers. This means that they hire more workers in order to maintain this. That means Facebook cannot have, uh, for example, a programmer working on both Facebook and Instagram. Instagram needs to have its own programmer. Facebook needs to have its own programmer. Instagram needs to have its own CEO. Facebook needs to have its own CEO. And ineffectively increases the amount of jobs within these areas. But more importantly, you lack the ability to lobby changes in laws, lack the ability to control information and hurt individuals on the ground and develop the highest amount of change to individuals being able to enter an industry that's extremely oppressive. For all those reasons, I will go. My back off. Do you mind doing everything? Yeah, sure. All right, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
Can now get. Um, I think Roshan is very convenient because his analysis was they have lesser money but somehow we have more jobs. Like, what is this correlation between the logical links that exist in the side of the speaker before me? But let's just point out a few things. Huh? The problem with government's case is that they say big tech has three specific problems. The first is that they lobby for power. Number two is that big data in of itself is bad. And number three, there's no competition. I think Ayman already told you in the first speech coming from the deal of is that lobbying power is something they were against also so we don't think that that's a problem breaking up big tech to solve if anything there's a problem in which big technologies have better understanding of the law and understanding of loopholes than congressmen so the way you should solve the problem is to get better congressmen that are more like informed about the kinds of things big tech companies can use to violate the law not by stopping big tech companies from doing whatever they want to do because that's only one part of the things that they do you're not comparing it to the overall benefit of better innovation cheaper goods affordable goods accessible goods all those things nothing that we heard from the government is just that lobbying power back yeah we agree lobbying power back we also want to reduce but that is not justification to why you should break up all of these big companies the second thing they say, big data is bad. Why is that the case? Your consumers consented to be in big data. They agreed to the terms and conditions. They, they literally click accept when they give away that. They consented to it. I don't think there's anything morally wrong with that. But number two, it's just a business idea. Companies make money. Companies give more jobs. They give more individuals the better form to access the kinds of products they want. So yes, it may be a bit weird that I was talking about it on Instagram and suddenly there's an ad about it. But is there really anything wrong about that? Because if I was, if I was going to buy that product, and that product is going to make me happy and now it's even easier for me to buy that product what is so wrong with that i don't know what is so problematic about big data the only thing we heard was oh companies can hack their big data there's not a problem there's not a problem of big tech companies that's a problem of the security of those companies a, a problem that all your small companies also have no thank you but if you're a big company you can actually have another branch that is focusing on security alone and this is where i push in my argument later the third thing we heard is competition why your competition going to be any good? Huh? If you have no money to innovate, you have no money to mass produce, you have no money to produce it, you have no, no money to manufacture, what is the competition going to look like? How far will it really go? The reason why this is important, no thank you, is because the level of competition is limited. No company wants to innovate to the maximum level possible because the point in which they do so, they'll be broken up. That means the level of innovation that comes from the world of government is severely limited, which will reduce the ability for consumers to get the best form of technology. I'll take you later. Let's Let's answer a few questions. The first, what is the barrier of innovation entry that a side of government wants to fight for? They give you the example of facial recognition technology. Let's assume in the case of side government, where a small company does facial recognition. The reason why that is really bad, because we all agree that facial recognition is a good idea, is a good technology. But in a world where they are forced to fend for their own, that means A, they have no ability to continuously give out updates because they have to focus on making sure other people want to buy their facial, rec facial recognition products. The reason why this is important is because big companies don't need to spend money on advertisements anymore because people know that they are big companies. This means big companies can redirect those funds into improving the general quality of facial recognition. So solving the problems about how Indian people can't be recognized by facial tech, something the government wanted to fight for. All those things can only improve if companies have money to improve it. But if it's a startup idea and only an idea then you have no ability to mass produce it the comparative the world of opposition is something that Ivan already told you no responses is that those companies are unicorn companies that big tech companies will buy over so that they can mass produce it so they can innovate it. they can make it better and more accessible for more individuals on the ground can you imagine amazon owns facial recognition technology and every single person every other small company can also use it your governments can also use it because of how cheap and accessible that is that's when you create an overall net benefit of certain products being produced. Yeah. So you are being very convenient. The status quo politicians don't understand. Lobbying exists to create really bad laws for this industry. So how will change occur on your side instead of just telling me change is going to occur? Okay, so that is not analyzing the principal discussion to why big tech companies are bad. Yeah, that's a practical harms, which is very easily mitigated if you have better laws, if you have equitable policies, if you have congressmen who are smarter, if we, we are smarter individuals that vote better congressmen. Yeah. Something I might already give to your POI. I don't think you're actually analyzing this debate at all. No, thank you. The second thing we'll say, the types of jobs that are created in the world of opposition is far better. The reason why we see so is a few levels. So if a big company is able to expand, they can also go into other countries. This is something the prime, uh, the leader of 
the deputy prime minister also conceded when he said that jobs will go to India and China. Which well, that's a good thing because you improve the overall demand for jobs and the supply for jobs as well. That means more individuals can opt in, more individuals will come to those situations. In the comparative is, if your companies are small, you can't expand this manner. You cannot be a multinational company if you're a small company, something that site government wants to fight for. Realize that when Amazon opens warehouses in all different countries, they create 60, like 600,000 jobs. And it's estimated to be much more than that to a level of 58 million by the year of 2022. The reason why all this is important, because you allow those kinds of monopolistic ideas and monopolistic companies to do these kinds of things. In the world of government, they don't get to do so. No, thank you. The second thing we'll say is that these companies are sustainable because they're very big, they can take risks. But not only about taking risks, but also that if the point which they fail, it's not that bad. When your small companies fail, they have to lay off all their workers. They have to lay off every single person because there's no money to sustain themselves. But bigger companies do. So bigger companies screw up. And we all agree tech companies screw up all the time. But in the world in which they do, at least they can keep their workers or the amount of individuals they have to lay off is lesser. The extension to this is also the types of jobs they're like, exist in a world of opposition. Our jobs are menial, low-skilled jobs. The reason why this is the case is because if you only have one tech company, let's assume huh, only one tech company, that's when your company needs to get more people in manufacturing, producing, in your factories. Those kinds of things cannot happen if you're a small tech company because you don't have the ability to buy factories or even use those factories because you're too focused on developing your technology and idea. In those worlds, the jobs that site government claim to be a marginal benefit is the jobs of the highest skilled individuals who are very privileged in their education, they're able to be cloud data analysts or whatever. I don't think those jobs are more important in comparison to the low skilled individuals that we need to elevate in, in society. The third argument that I'll push in my speech is better security. And this is an entirely new argument. I hope they respond to this. It's because your companies are not only one company. So you use an iPad, you use your iPhone, you use your Mac. All of these things are good in the sense that in the world in which your Apple releases an update in terms of security or better improvement, you only need to use one update. This means that it's very easy for you to have security patches because realize zero day attacks are very likely to occur in status quo. And you have so many small companies that use them, you violate the individual's use of data. So this is where you can say data being in one situation is bad. But I will say that because it's only in one place, that is when your companies can focus on security in those circumstances. Realize the in that is in this circumstances because your companies are huge, they can they, they can branch out into certain departments. So you can literally have a department of security, something that Apple does, but your small companies can't do that because they're too focused on other things that these companies are privileged not to be focused on. ironic that the female representation in this room is equivalent to the Silicon Valley, especially since we're debating a tech motion. Yeah. But Christina, I think there's something very important to note. The only argument that they presented to us, as much as they want to repeat the same thing over and over again in different words, is the idea of jobs. So as long as I can tackle that argument in my speech, their entire case literally false. What am I going to tell you in my speech? 
two issues, right? Firstly, as to the consumer base and the general public, because this is something that they were very much harping upon, especially after TJ in his speech presented to us the multiple types of benefits that we can have once we break up these large scale conglomerates. But also a second issue as to what will be better for the industry, which is directly responding to Sanji's argument about innovation, which he asked me to respond to. So I respond to it. But before that, I think there needs to be a clarification. I think them coming up here and harping on what TJ said in his speech about how the old people in the Senate don't understand technology and telling us that replacing the people in that particular workforce by hiring younger politicians or younger congressmen is very simplistic. Mainly because I don't think lobbying stops when you hire younger people in Congress. I think lobbying can happen even more. But more importantly, when you're talking about younger people in Congress, considering these people understand technology, I think it's also likely for them to buy into lobbying because they know that technology plays a very big role in our lives. More often than not, we as individuals can't even detach ourselves from the terms and, terms and conditions that we did not read before we click I accept. Because the only way to do so is to delete your Instagram, delete your Facebook, delete your WhatsApp, and there's no way our a society that's so interlinked to that technology can do so, right? But then let's go into like the issues because I think that, that's more important. Like. So firstly, let's talk about consumers, right? What should be considered? I think there are three things that should be considered. Firstly, as to privacy and security, which is something that we presented to you on our side. Secondly, innovation and access to better technology and thirdly, jobs, which is the main thing they wanted to talk about, right? In terms of privacy, which is the first layer to this issue, what necessarily is the problem? I think TJ very clearly stated in his speech, the problem isn't that Facebook can access your data or that Waze can know where you are at what point in time so they can direct bad drivers like me down the road. I think it's the fact that huge conglomerates like Facebook have access to all of this data. So it's not just the fact that your information with Facebook, like your full name or your age or who you're dating at that point in time is being breached. It's also the fact that things like your location, things like your phone number, things like your credit card numbers are being exposed. And this isn't a conspiracy like whether the FBI can see us changing in our rooms to the camera, it is something that has been proven time and time again in things like the Cambridge Analytica, in things like Disney scandal years ago when they used data of children against parental consent just to make sure that they can earn money. So I think by using individuals' personal data that they gave to you for service in order to earn your own money by using it in any other form other than what that user intended for you to do, that in itself is already principally unjust. But I think the ex it doesn't excuse the exploitation of data that these companies engage in. So the point in which they breach your privacy, we're able to do something about this. But more importantly, in response to their defense alternative, no well, thank you, which is the fact that people can conduct legal suits. Why does this not work? The legal system within the status quo only extends to companies who sell your data, not companies who use it. That's why Facebook finds loopholes and sells you targeted ads instead, because in that way, they don't violate the law. So more often than not, your legal suits don't go through. But more importantly, in your best case, if legal suits are being charged, you're asking that the average 30-year-old mom who's using Facebook, who's being so targeted at and does not like the fact that Facebook knows what she likes, to sue a huge conglomerate like Facebook. I think accountability is also something that's effectively lower on the other side when people on the ground simply cannot access this form of usage considering the power that these companies Wait, have. Uh, but the next level to this, no thank you, is the idea of innovation and access to better technology. And the two things that Sanji said about this in his speech. Firstly, as to the idea of cheaper and more accessible goods. I think the monopoly more likely than not, your goods are more likely to get expensive. That's why my brand rights are 20 bucks more expensive than they used to be after they bought over Uber. No shade, right? But more importantly, I think monopolies are also extremely expensive to your consumer base. So if you want your consumer base to access cheaper alternatives, I think our side is likely to go back those cheaper alternatives the moment smaller companies can stand up. But on the second level, which he provided to me, people cannot access because big companies don't want to re release updates to their technology due to other companies. Competition works, Lade. If you look at it, if I have a company who I'm competing upon, it's likely for me to produce more technologies that's better for my consumer base. So I think innovation can happen on our side. To give you an easier layman example, just because I'm a debater and Sanji is also a debater, doesn't mean Sanji can not continue improving in his debating career. I think it's very important to note this. But more importantly, I think that it's also important to note that smaller companies with large-scale ideas also cannot develop. The moment these larger conglomerates buy them over and shut them down or use their ideas and develop them in completely wrong ways instead of doing it for the people. But finally, as to jobs, because this is the only thing they wanted to tell us about, does outside lead people to losing their jobs? No. Firstly, more companies in the picture mean you are likely to contest the job market monopolies have been able to provide. So it's not that there are less jobs in the market, it just means Facebook has less jobs 
jobs in the market. There are other smaller companies who will hire you. There are companies like Instagram who are also well founded. Companies like Wix who are also well founded. It's just that the fact that Facebook buys them over, Google buys them over, and it replaces the workers in them with their own workers. But more importantly, just because Facebook has less jobs doesn't mean that you, as an individual, are able to get a job in other smaller companies. Which then leads me to my second point, right? Your working conditions and the ties that you're being able to be laid off by these big companies is something that's very important to consider because sure, larger companies may hire more people in the status quo, but they also lay off mass amounts of individuals yeah. because technology continues to improve. Sure. So your Amazon worker in your factory, what job can he get if all your big tech companies don't have factories anymore in your world? Bro, your Amazon factory will your Amazon factory will still exist. That's in the manufacturing sector. I don't think that you have to look into tech companies where programmers are people you talk about. And TJ yeah, yeah. is probably one of those people who will hopefully be hired by Google. Probably not gonna happen. But more importantly, I think that your working conditions are likely to improve in the point where you're competing with other companies because you have the incentive to make sure the good tech companies and the good tech programmers in your company continue staying with you. So I think on our side, that is also improved. But on a smaller issue of innovation, I don't think it's that Facebook doesn't want to innovate or release the patch for Candy Crush Saga. I think it's also very important to note the reason why innovation is less isn't because Facebook doesn't want to innovate, it's because of the material that Roshan and TJ presented in their speech. And that is that smaller companies who want to innovate, the think tanks that are able to produce more and more types of technology that can better cater to consumer bases are being shut down because Facebook doesn't want a competition, because Google doesn't want a competition, maybe because Alibaba also doesn't want a competition, right? But more importantly, I think that innovation, one, better exists on our side without the breach of security or privacy of the people on the mm -hmm. ground. But secondly, if you're talking about the job they wanted to talk about to preserve. On the outside, there are more companies, meaning there are more jobs, and just because Facebook can't give you as many jobs, doesn't mean there are other companies out there who cannot do so. I think it's unfair for them to paint this out as such. But on comparative on the outside, we protect the consumers, we protect these industries, extremely proud of those. <laughs> yeah, I would not like to provide on this. Um,
Okay. I bet Roshan wishes that he just can call new matter on all the things that me and Ima wanted to say because they didn't really respond to it. like so many things, you know. We told you innovation is better. We told you goods are cheaper because companies don't need to spend on advertising. They can just make sure goods are better quality. The response we heard to this was that because they're monopolies, no one can compete. We told you that this is unlikely to actually be the case because there will always be competition. But we will agree it won't be to that extent that government wants, but it will be existed. So if Grab really hikes up the prices that much, that's why we have Micah. Facebook is going to be really shit. That's why you opt into Google. So that means that even if the ability to opt out is lesser, it doesn't mean the ability to opt out is non-existent. This means that the benefit coming from competition that we heard from government really very, very marginalized, especially when you want to compare it to the overall benefits of monopoly. When you have better innovation, where your innovation actually goes to people on the ground because it's more accessible, because it's cheaper. Like look at Amazon basics, bro. Like groceries are so cheap, they can deliver to you directly. Why are all these things bad? I don't know, because no competition. Now, that's not true, right? If there's no competition, why is it this good? Why is it this level of quality? Because they're this level of quality, other companies also have to be that level of quality to stay relevant in the market. Things that we said already, no, 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 respond. Some people that side. So let's answer two things, right? The first, are small companies really good? Like, please, the like government, they're not, they got no money. So if you really want more jobs, your job is for the richest, the most highly skilled or very entrepreneurial people who probably will not succeed. So if your small companies fail, you really die. You, know, you got no jobs, your people cannot have any like purchasing power, you have no income because you're very small. So you cannot take a lot of risk. If you cannot take a lot of risk, you cannot expand. That means your competition, best case, is in Slango. So you have one further selling Kuropo Ikan, one further selling Kuropo Ikan cheese because that's all the innovation you can go for. <laughs> if you go further, you will lose out. And if you lose out, your whole business and existence will die out. Therefore, no one will take that risk anymore. I don't know why you cannot hear this from my speeches just now. The second thing they say, is big, big data really that bad? I don't think so. You consented to it, you accepted in terms of conditions, you went into it. The problem with big data is how people consent and how people read the terms of conditions. That is not a problem with big companies. There's a problem of how we educate people when it comes to data. So I might say this already is POI. If people are more informed, then they can unlike to face this problem. It's a technical issue, not a principle issue as to why big data is bad. Especially when we say if big data means targeted advertisements, targeted advertisements are good because that increases individuals' personal happiness because you can buy their stuff easier and their stuff is likely to be cheaper. So really, I don't know what Gov has going for them anymore. Innovation. Is innovation very important? Both sides will agree, yes. Is innovation needed to be accessible for individuals on the ground? Both sides will also agree, yes. But your side is a small company with a small ability to actually innovate and expand their innovation. Their margin of error is very huge and their guarantee of success is also unlikely to materialize. Therefore, your accessibility argument does not come from the world of government. In opposition, however, will, will exist because the accessibility and credibility is how your companies run. Your big companies make more money if more people buy their stuff. More people buy their stuff when it's cheaper and accessible. So it's very clear, very intuitive. Your things are going to exist much better. We told you in my speech already that the innovation that exists has to come when you spend on money on R&D. You have to spend on ads. You have to make sure people are palatable with it. You have to make it creative. All of those things, big companies no need to do because they have existing images. They have existing departments that prioritize and specialize in all these things. Something your small companies don't have. So really, innovation unlikely to reach people on the ground. Access to things. In our world, we have like cheaper things, but maybe it can be more expensive, but I think that's okay because those are still things that people can access in comparison to your small companies that are unlikely to be able to cater to those individuals. The second thing we'll say is that the low skilled individuals, the most marginal, vulnerable group of people on the ground, those are people we protect because Amazon has more money to expand to other countries. The moment they do this, they have to build factories in other countries. They need to have other people working in those factories. Something I said in my speech, your reply was, oh, they, we also want factories. You cannot have the factories. You have no money to build those factories because you're going to break up Amazon in the first place. So what benefits do you materialize in the world of government at the end of the day? We think nothing. We think you get the idealistic world or small companies existing but that's all
So let's have a little bit of fun in this reply speech, okay? So you have a note that you've written down for all your speeches, Sanjay and Ahmad. Take out your notes and read up where you can find economies of scale. Where you can find, this is the word I'm talking about, new industries improving from smaller industries, talking about hiring more minority workers, your coercion idea that came up within his speech, or in the majority of cases, all these argumentations, okay? So the reason why it's particularly important is because he's off with. If you come up with new analysis that leads to new argumentations, that is new matter. If you don't talk about economies or scales within your first two speakers, you cannot come up with an off with and talk about it. More importantly, a couple of things I need to clarify. So, guys, guys, turn it down. I can hear you from all the way up here. Okay, so their side wants to talk about three things. Things are going to be cheaper, innovation is going to be better, and it's going to be better access to these things. So, important clarification. Firstly, they talk, Sandy wants to talk about improving jobs from, for example, factories. DJ has said this, I have said this, and Audrey has said this. This debate is about tech companies. You show me one tech company that has a factory. The reason why it's different is because tech companies and manufacturing industries are completely different areas. That means when a tech company breaks down, it doesn't mean manufacturing industries fall lower. There was no analysis to why this links. But more importantly, right, his three, the three burdens that you want to think about, things are cheaper and better access. I want to ask you a really important question. What thing becomes cheaper? Seeing that Google is already free, right, and Facebook is already free, and all the access is already available, how does this become cheaper? This is a new matter, by the way. This is me taking the argumentation and asking you, what is the conclusions that come from this? The idea is, that came up with the TJ speech, is that we sell these things, the data, from other people. You don't get a benefit on it and you don't lose out. Accessibility is already present. So I don't know what burden they're trying to prove in this debate, other than development happens within these areas in this debate. So what am I going to talk about? What did they fail to respond to? A, consolidation of data by people. This is where we talk about privacy. This is the most important thing. Okay. In the end, if we can prove that an individual is harmed to an extent that is unreproachable, that individual is something that we should prioritize in this debate. This means that they are legal consent. We told you that you can't consent to these things because there's no opt-out mechanism between Audrey's speech, my speech, and my POI to poet, right? Meaning to say, I can't get a job if I don't know how to make a Google Doc, for example. I can't get a job if I don't go on LinkedIn or Facebook or have the ability to socialize or climb up the social ladder. All these things allows me to, for example, not understand. I don't understand how the system works because we already say people are unsmart about this. So what consent do you want when you don't have an opt-out mechanism? All these things already asked, no analysis towards this. So in the end, is there a harm? If I steal your credit card data, which happens within Cambridge Analytica, and I rob your bank account, that is a harm you didn't consent to. These are things that we talked about within TJ's and on speech. On top of that, they come up here and tell me about other argumentations, i.e. they talk to me about regulations of laws. This is where they're convenient. They tell me principal argumentations. What principle you want? You need to prove to me why laws are something that's going to change on your side of the house in the status quo when it's harmful. You need to prove to me that your Congress is going to change. You need to prove to me that lobbying is going to change. They take all of our argumentations and just say, fiat, we can assume that it doesn't happen in this debate. If, if you take our argumentations at its best, or take the debate at its best, all these things don't happen. If you talk about predicting interest being a benefit, or in the end of the day, if you want to talk about, for example, top-down economies, you already told you how that doesn't happen. But let's just say you buy into the idea that big companies means more investments. We already told you that small companies means governments get to invest within, for example, other data industries, talking about focus groups and everything. No response to these type of things. In the end of the debate, it's a bubble debate because they refuse to engage with our matter, so we can assume the matter is something that's present or equal. But if we have to trade out every form of innovation, for an individual's safety to be able to access these type of things, we're more than happy to break up tech conglomerates. Without a site that analyzes their burdens, without a site that proves to us what becomes cheaper, what becomes better, and only tells us, for example, there's more access to jobs, or only tells us, for example, there's more innovation, but refuse to accept the harms that comes to a dehumanization of individual, stealing of personal information, lack of ability to consent, the ability for these data companies to change and ruin laws. I think after this is